uh, our favorite doctor, Dr. Sean Landsman, and the Ask the Biologist segment. Every time I see you, there's just a whole lot of teeth and a smile, man. <laughs> always happy. Good to hang out with you again, Sean. Thanks, John. Yeah, happy to be here. I always get a kick out of the fact that your mom is lurking in the ba background uh, watching this because I think my both my parents are too. There's not a lot to do in, in COVID times and they're probably talking about my hair, which hasn't been cut in a year. I'm, uh, I'm yeah. due for a haircut for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I just got it this past week. My mom is 87 and she grinds on me, you know, when I'm not looking, when the long hair thing isn't her thing. And so, you know, I got a few letters. I read them out earlier and we're both just really happy that our parents care about us. Love you yeah. a lot, mom. Thanks for being here. And uh, I hope you and enjoy the musky talk today. What are you going to teach my mom today, Sean? We're going to, I'm going to teach your mom about musky vision and color uh, and how uh, muskies pick up color and shapes and things in, in their environment and how Really, their vision is um, perfectly attuned to the uh, to the, the environment in which they live. So, um, hopefully, there's going to be some some interesting little tidbits of information that people will pick up on that might help them make some more maybe more informed decisions about uh, about uh, bait uh, color choice in the future. All right, so let's get this kicked off. So. Before we actually dive into this topic too much, we we want to uh, I want to set a little bit of groundwork here about what exactly um, what structures in the eye uh, relate to how how fish and other animals are able to perceive the world around them. And if you're um, if you're a little bit familiar with rods and cones, you may have you may have heard of these before, but you might not be that aware of what exactly they do. So here on the right, it's just a schematic of uh, what these two structures look like. So you can see, you know, the rods here uh, gets the name gets name from this structure there, and then the cones there. And both of these structures have. Uh, in some ways, similar purposes, and in other ways, uh, very different functions. So, for example, rods are really well attuned to uh, to helping animals uh, uh, with vision uh, at at night. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, cones play a big role in daytime vision. The other thing rods do really well is they help animals pick up movement. Uh, shape and then just able to discern general um, differences in size of things that they're looking at. Uh, cones, on the other hand, this is really where color comes into play. So uh, the rods aren't really responsible for um, for de detecting color. Um, it's the cones that really do that. And then from the cones, you also get some uh, information related to detail uh, as well as shape. Now, what we uh, should also get into a little bit here is that there's actually two kinds of cones. Uh, so we have a single cone and a double cone. And a single cone in an animal eye is really better at distinguishing detail, um, but a double cone is, is better at distinguishing shape uh, and can detect more color as well. Um, so cone, double cone cells are also sensitive to yellow-orange wavelengths, whereas single cone cells are more sensitive to like greens and purples and blues. So keep that in mind because we're going to take a look at what we know about um, musky or maybe to be a little more specific, esocid uh, eye structures. So the, the question that I've, I've gotten in the past, I actually gave a similar um, presentation to the Ottawa chapter of Muskies Canada uh, not too long ago. And um, one of the questions I got was, uh, do muskies actually see in color? And the, the bottom line is that no one's actually looked into this specifically with muskies, but they have with pike. And of course, what we know is that pike and muskies uh, are very closely related. So what we know from pike, I think it's, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty reasonable to extrapolate that to muskies, okay? So if we operate under that assumption, then that's, let's take a look at, uh, at, at what we've got here. And so when we look at pike eyes and probably by extension, musky eyes as well, what we see are um, three structures in, uh, in the eye itself. Uh, we've got the rods, we've got double cones, and we've got single cones. The most prevalent structure in a pike eye or in a socket's eye 
um, would be the rods. And in the, uh, the, the second place there are double cones, and then the least prevalent would be the single cone cells. So what really does this mean then for muskies? Um, well, this, this means a, a handful of things. First of all, um, a muskie's vision is adapted to dark or dim conditions. And this makes sense. If anyone has ever dived into the water and gone down uh, you know, a, a few feet or even eight or 10 feet, however far your, your breath can kind of take you, or if you're a scuba diver, you know just how dark it is down at depth. And so this makes sense that muskies would have vision that is well adapted to darker conditions. Keep in mind too that these, uh, that these, that, that this fish species, muskies, they're actually, they actually evolved as a riverine species um, and now can inhabit lakes, of course, but they evolved from riverine ancestors. So what do we typically think of with rivers? Rivers tend to be uh, darker, dirtier water. St. Lawrence River aside, that's got like Caribbean-esque uh, water clarity, but a lot of rivers um, are, pretty, uh, are, are pretty dirty and, and dingy. Um, so there, what we also know from the, the structure of their eyes is that they work very well in daylight. So they've had, they, have those, uh, they have a pretty high percentage of uh, cone cells. And so that also tells us not only can their eyes see well in darkness, but they can also see pretty well in daylight as well. Um, because there's a lot of rods, uh, the, that structure within their eyes, um, they can also easily detect movement. They can also easily distinguish shapes. And again, distinguishing shapes uh, is a function both of rods and cone cells. And so they have a high uh, percentage of, of both of those structures in their eyes. Um, we also know that they're attuned to yellows, oranges, and reds based on the pretty high percentage of, uh, of, of double cone cells that we see within their eyes. Um, but because detail is not prioritized. We know detail is not prioritized because of the single cone cells and the relatively uh, limited number of them within, within their eyes. So, so they're able to pick up color, but they're not able to really pick up detail. And that's why I included that picture there of those live target crankbaits. Live target lures are famous in the angling community for creating these ultra realistic paint jobs, but at least with muskies, I think that those are probably gonna catch more buyers than, than they are fish. In other words, I wouldn't be that concerned about like specific patterning. You can see on that smallmouth crankbait and the, uh, the second from the top there, and I guess that one on the bottom, you can see the, you know, how the barring kind of looks very random, much like you'd probably see on a fish. Um, and I, you know, that kind of, that level of detail, I don't think uh, needs to apply in, in musky lures. Um, now, of course, John, uh, I think is having some, maybe some internet issues here. I was gonna get him to show. I'm there back. He is. He's I'm back. back, he's back. All right, hold up that Susie sucker or that Medusa behind you. I've got a picture of that Shadzilla there. But you know, to be honest, I do not own a Sherbert colored or whatever that you wanna call a fire tail colored uh, uh, bait like that, but uh, you know, it's something to consider. I know John likes to throw that on, on the on the Ottawa, and uh, that is a pattern to consider because what we know about the structure of at least you know pike and, and musky eyes is that they are uh, uh, they're they're pretty well attuned to yellows, oranges, and reds. Uh, there you go. Exactly, exactly. I do like fire tail baits for uh, for topwater lures too. Um, all right, so. Um, something else we should probably get into a little bit though is color and how it relates to depth within a water column. Uh, so again, if any of you are scuba divers, uh, you know that when you get down to depth that everything looks really washed out. There's a reason, you know, uh, uh, GoPro sells red filters uh, underwater is to bring some of that red back in because red, when you get down at depth, red is one of the, is one of the first colors to get filtered out of the water column. So what this, uh, what this diagram shows here is as we go deeper, the only color at this, in this case is 250 meters of depth. The only color that we might be able to see down there would be like blues and, and purples, okay? 
but reds, oranges, yellows, those get filtered out of the water column really quickly, okay? Um, so this also probably makes sense, okay? If we know that muskies and pike uh, are have eyes that are well attuned to yellows, oranges, and reds, if they spent most of their time in deep water, then they probably wouldn't have eyes that, that relate or that are that specifically adapted to those wavelengths of light. So what we know from their biology is that they are a pretty shallow water dwelling fish. And so this makes sense then that they would have eyes that are really well adapted to yellows, oranges, and reds, um, which are, are very visible in shallow water. So what does this mean for you? Um, one important thing to consider though, is if we talk about bait color pattern and how like a fish and a muskie in this case might be able to pick it up. So you always have to consider the, the surround, the background. And uh, I was trying to find uh, an old muskie hunter, uh, uh, article. I, I think it was one that Steve Hiding uh, authored and I don't remember the year, but I, I remember the images and I remember when I was younger flipping through and just pouring over, just like burned this article into my memory. Basically what he did was he took pictures of different baits with different filters or different um, uh, like uh, colored film over the front of his camera lens to give you a sense of what it might look like to look at a particular color pattern uh, based on certain water colors that you might be dealing with. So in the Ottawa River, we have, you know, we have water that's pretty dark, right? It might be, it might look kind of like my, my shirt here. Um, and so if you had an all brown bait with this as the background, it's not gonna come, it's not gonna appear very well. So if you've got a dark water color, what you might wanna opt for is a brighter colored bait, whether that's, you know, all white or chartreuse or bright yellow or bright orange, something like that to help it stand out from the background a bit. Um, again, if, if you were in clear water, you might, you might go the other way. So if the water is pretty bright, the background is fairly bright, you might go with something darker. So you might go with like an all black or something. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind, and I know like jailbird pattern baits and, and you know, John's got some, some blade colors like that in the background there. Um, I, I certainly have high contrasting baits but one thing to remember in the animal world uh, is that, it, especially if you're a prey species of some sort, um, having the ability to camouflage yourself with the available with the environment is going to ensure your survival. So there's something called disruptive camouflage. So you might be tempted to think that a high contrasting bait like that jailbird suic there might be really easy to pick up in the water column, but in fact that kind of a color pattern is what we might call disrupt, disruptive um, camouflage. Now, disruptive camouflage, we get into a little more technical stuff there, and that involves some more random shapes and patterns. But having that kind of barring pattern um, actually makes it really difficult to, uh, it makes it harder for a predator to pick up the outline of an animal um, in, in the distance or against the background. So. Um, you might actually think that that's actually a really bright colored, like easy to spot bait, when in fact, it might be actually a little more subtle, which is not necessarily a bad thing because predators are accustomed to not seeing things that are super bright and bold in their environment. That said, something super bright and bold can stand out really easily and, and make it a, 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 a target, an easy target. And again, if you're targeting shallow water, you might think about incorporating some yellows, oranges, and reds into your into your bait choice, uh, in part because that will stand out in shallower water because those wavelengths, um, those, those wavelengths of light haven't been filtered out yet. And number two, because we know musky eyes are well attuned to those, um, to those colors. Um, and um, the uh, vision or lateral line system uh, is, is something that I, I get asked that quite a bit. Um, which one is more important for muskies? And one of my favorite studies actually looked at this. Um, they effectively blinded and knocked out the lateral lines and then look on, on juvenile fish, 
fed them some uh, fathead minnows, and then looked at how easily they were able to capture or how efficiently they were able to capture their prey. And what they found was that muskies use vision to detect, so they see movement. Okay, remember, they got rods, a lot of rods in their eyes that helps detect movement. And then they will orient to the prey. So they use vision to, to detect and then orient to prey. The vision system is also used to initiate that rapid strike where they curl up into an S pattern and then shoot forward. But actually making those really fine scale adjustments to actually nail that fish or duck or whatever it happens to be, that is the, that's the function of the lateral line. And that helps them make these little last second adjustments to grab their prey. Um, so muskies are just as good at capturing prey when they're blinded, so when they're just using their lateral line, as they are with sight intact, uh, um, with their sight intact. So um, bottom line, muskies are the, definitely the apex predators of their environment and perfect hunting machines in, in, freshwater, in freshwater systems. So again, as always, if you have more questions, please submit them to John, or you can email me directly. There's my email there, and I'm happy to, uh, yeah, to field your questions. Awesome as usual, Sean. Thanks. Even the parts that I missed. I sorry, I had to disappear for All 15 right. minutes and have a heart attack over technology. <laughs> I love technology. Um, a couple of comments and questions. I got my scuba license when I was 16, so I could go and look go and look for fish. Um, interestingly, that the purple is the color that appears deeper than anything else. Um, did you talk about bright days versus dark days and, and color selections on those at all? Did we touch on that? We didn't, no, we didn't touch on that. Um, I mean, you know, at, when it's darker out, you're just gonna have less light filtering through the water column. So, you know, anything, anything that would, you know, normally appear pretty bright, especially toward the surface is going to be reduced even more. If you've got a darker uh, a darker sky, you might try you know either going even darker than that or if it's like a really dark stormy condition and the fish is looking up, you might want to you might want to go with like a, a white you know a white colored bait. It just sort of depends on on how dark the conditions are. Um, I love white baits. Pete Mayna once said to me that just about everything a muskie eats has a white belly. It's true. Looking underneath. So, you know, white is a, a an underused color for us. When I started muskie fishing in the 70s, the first rule of color that was explained to me was you can use any color you want as long as it's black. Yeah. And and that's that's still a good rule. And and in the modern day, um dark days, dark colors. Light days, light colors is a, a fairly standard rule that people fishing for any fish go for. And, and that applies, you know, that applies uh, from, to me and for my thinking for muskies. So on a really bright sunny day, again, because we didn't get to answer this so well a couple weeks ago, um, this has been probably my best bright sunshine day color over anything else uh, for years. This is also a good color I've learned at night and in dark days, I think, because it's reflective like a moon eye. But, you know, picturing a fish that's underneath a bait and looking up, it looks like a disco ball. They can't get uh, a, a, a real uh, visual on, on what it is, just that it's got a lot of shine and uh, refractivity and, and something that they go and hit. So, um, yeah, some basic rules. Yeah, Great the, that white white color patterns. I used to use white a lot in in shad based reservoirs. Uh, growing up fishing Illinois bodies of water, um, but when I when I moved up here, white works pretty well in in, in the, some of the darker colored water bodies around here. So um, it stands out really well. It kind of glows um, when you get that dark brown, that dark brown water. Um, so it's definitely one of my one of my favorite uh, color patterns for sure. White of some of some sort. Me too. Me too. Especially yeah. in the fall. Hopefully that gives everybody a, a few more choices, a little more insight into picking the lure that's going to catch the big fish. And uh, thanks again, Sean. Um, learn new stuff every week with you, my friend. Appreciate you being here.